Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to this morning's live. Uh, this morning, what we really wanted to talk about was something that next to budget, we get asked absolutely the most questions about, and that's energy efficiency, everything to do with how to reduce fuel bills, make your homes more energy efficient, and reduce your carbon footprint. So I'm absolutely delighted to say that this morning um, we have energy expert Tomas O'Leary from Mossart going to join us. And Tomas actually built uh, the first passive house in Ireland, which he lives uh, in with his family. So he did that in 2005. So he's an absolute expert and uh, he's going to do his best to answer all of your questions. So be sure to uh, ask questions as we go along. Um, you know, these Q&A are a fabulous way to connect with these experts. It was the whole idea of doing them. So do make sure to uh, make the best use of the time that we have this morning. And I just want to take the time before um, I invite Tomas in, just to let you know about next Saturday. So next Saturday, instead of um, my live session, here on Optimize Home. I'm actually going to be speaking um, with Lorraine Keane over at the Finished uh, Virtual Home Show. So this is a fantastic idea by Finished. Um, you know, these trade shows are absolutely wonderful ways for people to connect with lots and lots of different brands, to get advice, you know, just to meet people face to face. But obviously we haven't been able to do that recently. Uh, and even for us as a brand, it's been really frustrating just, uh, you know, not being able to connect with people. So that's why for me, the Q and A's have been absolutely wonderful. The feedback's been amazing. So this is just such a great idea. Um, there's lots of different brands exhibiting, uh, Optimize Home are going to have a stand, so our fantastic team are going to be available um, and you'll be able to register. I'm going to pop all the details in our bio and I'll pop some info on our stories a little bit later as well. But what you'll essentially be able to do is just like a trade show, you'll be able to go, you'll be able to chat to the different brands, uh, you'll be able to ask questions. And then on the center stage where I'll be speaking at 11 o'clock, there's lots and lots of fabulous speakers from all different areas. Um, so it really is a jam packed event and so worth uh, checking out. So as I say, I'm gonna pop all the details uh, in our stories and in the bio. And all you need to do is register and then you can check out and see who else is exhibiting but do make sure to check in at 11 o'clock next Saturday there. So I'm going to invite Thomas uh, Tomas in now to join us. There we go. Morning. Good morning. Hi Tomas, how are you? Very good. Thanks. Great to be here. Oh, Thanks listen, for thank invitation. you so much. I mean, we're just so lucky to have your expertise here uh, for this time this morning. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's been quite a bit of change with the new regulations coming in at the end of last year. And I guess what we're seeing from our, our side of things to most is that so many people, this is a major concern and there's a lot of confusion about it. You know, people are... Uh, they're looking for knowledge, but it, it's not so easy for them to get their hands on that in many cases. So an awful lot of questions for people. So my hope this morning is that we can kind of demystify all of that a little bit and uh, answer some of these. Um, and I mentioned in the intro actually that you, you built the first passive house in Ireland, which is incredible. So that was amazing. Yeah, so we, I went to a conference in Tralee in 2002 and uh, there was a Swedish architect talking about Passive House and I was so blown away by the idea. Um, I phoned my wife and I said, look, we should sell our family home and build a Passive House. And um, she was a bit shocked, obviously, but, you know, I brought her around eventually and um, we, we, we found the site and we, we got planning permission and, and the rest is history. So, um, yeah, we built that in 2004 and at the time, it was very much cutting edge. In fact, it's still, you know, 16 years later ahead really? of national building regulations. Yeah. And we had triple glazing, we had airtight construction, mechanical ventilation system, solar panels for heating water, solar panels for making electricity. And it was really um, a baptism of fire for me. I had no idea what I was doing, if I'm honest, um, because it hadn't been done before. Of course. But, but we made the standard and we got certified and we've been living here now for the last 
16 years and so my kids have never known anything else my kids don't know what a draft is they don't know what a radiator is <laughs> and um so we've had lots of fun with that that's amazing absolutely amazing and it must have been quite an expensive undertaking actually just with everything being so new at the time um you know it's a very brave thing to take on yeah yeah i suppose looking back i don't know if it was brave or just sheer madness or a bit of both um I mean, because we were doing it for the first time, uh, a lot of the suppliers were quite helpful in terms mm -hmm. of giving me a bit of a deal on materials yeah. because there was a lot of marketing around it. We've had Brilliant. well over, I mean, we've had several thousands of people visit the house over the years. Um, but what we're finding now in our own practice is that um, we're, just, we're able to design passive houses um, and you know, the construction cost doesn't come in any higher than mm -hmm. conventional construction because the energy efficiency in Ireland has been sort of gradually catching up with passive house and the cost differential nowadays is really nothing. Okay, that's really interesting. Yeah, great. And great, great for people to know that too. That's fantastic. Brilliant. Well, mm -hmm. most, one, one of the things I suppose um, at the moment is NZEP that, that people are uh, asking about. And can you just give a, because I know you're you have a fabulous setup and uh, incredibly knowledgeable about all of this. So could you just give people a, a little bit of insight into that and what it means if they're planning yeah. uh, a home renovation? Yeah, so basically NZ stands for Nearly Zero Energy Building. And mm -hmm. this was a requirement. So a decade ago, the European Commission said, right, in 10 years time, in 2020, all countries in Europe would have to impose the NZ efficiency standard um, right across the EU. Mm -hmm. So every country has their own particular way of nuance of kind of specifying that. But the Irish regulation came into force in the first of no or the, the end of November last year. So mm -hmm. effectively, um, for new build construction, you now have to build to the NZ standard. But tagged into that was a kind of a, a retrofit requirement. And I think it's a very pragmatic and sensible um, move on the part of the government. So essentially, um, if you're doing what's called a major renovation to your home, so that mm. wouldn't be just attic insulation, but let's say wall insulation or cavity or you know, so, some sort of major event in your house, if, that, if those works are affecting more than 25% of the surface area of your house, and not the floor area, but the surface area of the house, Mm -hmm. you're obliged to bring the whole house up to a new standard. Okay. So mm -hmm. for example, if you were having to re-roof your house for some reason, or if you're having, if you're planning on externally insulating, let's say the walls of the house, which a lot of people are doing now, that would yeah. probably impact on 25% of the surface area. Mm -hmm. So if you're in, in, in an F rated house, you know, the jump from an F to a B2 is quite significant. And you know, that, legislation could be quite impactful for you in terms mm -hmm. of cost but obviously you're going to save a lot of energy comfort to be better mm -hmm. the value of your home will be improved and so forth if mm -hmm. you're already at a c or maybe a b3 rating you know this lift is not much but of course, I, I mean yeah. the, the general principle is yeah the general principle i suppose is if you're going through the disruption of having contractors in your house and you know maybe borrowing money to do some works uh, the rationale for this is look um, our, our planet is under pressure. 40% of carbon emissions globally are from buildings and buildings are a fairly easy fix. So the, the philosophy, I suppose, is if you're going to do some works on your house, we're going to try and make you to do some energy efficiency measures as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it makes sense. Absolutely. That's terrific. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned uh, insulation there. And again, I guess a lot of people are considering this um, at the moment and there's the whole question between external insulation versus the internal insulation and what's the best now yeah. what we we often say to people you know if you are doing a major renovation uh and you're kind of working on all the rooms in the house then internally insulating is is a more cost effective option because you're not going to you know you'd be disrupting all mm -hmm. the rooms anyway but what are your thoughts on on what the best yeah. solution for people I mean, it, 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 there's always a bit of a debate on that. From an energy efficiency point of view, not taking aesthetics into account or anything like that, just pure mm -hmm. building physics, if you will, mm -hmm. it's always better to put the insulation on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so 
for example, if you if you insulate internally, you're talking about a major rec redecoration. You know, you have to take all the skirting boards off, you have to lift all the sockets, move all the radiators, change your window boards, curtain mm -hmm. rails. You know, you mm -hmm. name it. Mm -hmm. Now, as you say, uh, Denise, if you're doing a major renovation inside in the house anyway, that's not going to be of any consequence. Sure. But if your house is in a reasonably good nick, uh, aesthetically, you know, and it functions well, and you know, you're happy with the interior then mm -hmm. it, it, it's, um, you know, unless you're in a listed building where you're not allowed to change the facade, um, it always makes sense to put the insulation on the outside. And um, mm -hmm. it's almost like putting a tea cosy, you know, to use maybe a, a silly analogy, it's always better to put a tea cosy on the outside of your teapot rather mm -hmm. than on the inside. Um, yeah. so, so, so that would be our approach. And, um, and you've, no you've no loss of floor area or anything like that if mm -hmm. you go external. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And and cost like um, because it is a substantial investment, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is a substantial investment, and the rates will vary across the country, um, mm. and also you know rates vary because you know we've just we've come out of a major construction crash in the economy, and you know before COVID nineteen pandemic we had a situation where there was a shortage of labour, so costs are fluctuating. Mm. all the time but it could be anywhere from let's say 100 euros a square meter to maybe 130 140 um, okay. euros a square meter and yeah. you, you know different con very experienced contractors who do this at scale will give you a better rate and it also depends on the thickness of the insulation um, mm. but what i would say denise is if you're going to do external insulation you know you're, you have the disruption, you have the scaffolding, you have the, you have the guys in your, in your, in your garden, mm -hmm. you know, you have the external finishes. All of those things remain the same, irrespective of the thickness of insulation you go for. So okay. what I would say is don't penny pinch. On the, the actual insulation product itself is quite cheap. Mm -hmm. Irrespective if you go for 50 millimeters, 100 millimeters, you still need scaffolding and the, the external plaster and the anchors and all of that. So mm -hmm. what, what we would say to Denise is, look, you, if you're going to externally insulate your house, you would probably only have the stomach to do that once in your lifetime. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so if you're, like, you know, don't skimp on the insulation thickness is what I would say. Even, I've even seen clients, we have clients who do a step-by-step -step retrofit so rather than kind of wasting their money only putting 50 millimeters on the whole house and saying afterwards, God, I wish I put 100 millimeters or four inches. You know, mm. there are people who actually even do it in half, right? I'm going to do the front of the house and the gable this year. And, um, you know, maybe in a few years time, I, I'll do the other part of the house. So our little motto on that is whatever you're doing, doing it, do it right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, if you've only got a small piece of butter left for your toast, you know, you're better concentrating that butter in one area and really getting the sort of and satisfaction of that rather than kind of smearing it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, I, you know, to us, it's exactly what we would say as well with uh, any kind of building work in your home. Like it is so disruptive to have builders in. So rather than thinking, well, I'll do little mm -hmm. pieces, uh, you know, every so years. I mean, it, just the disruption of that and the cost of doing that so it's far better to get mm -hmm. everything done at once if you're in a position to do it so yeah it makes sense with the insulation as well i just saw that we got a question mm -hmm. there what is the recommended um thickness for the average irish home for external insulation yeah so what i yeah what i would say ideally 150 millimeters which is okay. six inches in old money um, and yeah. it does depend on the insulation product you're going to use Mm -hmm. So, for example, there, there, there are more or less kind of stiff insulation boards and uh, fiber-based insulation boards. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on the product you choose, go for a very high-performance, sort of dense um, foam type of insulation. You can get the same insulation value for a thinner piece, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. um, what I would say, I suppose, is talk to the, talk to the insulation contractor and say to them, you know, how much insulation are most people going for? And they'd probably say 100 millimeters or something like that. And then say to them, look, I was thinking actually of going a bit further, you know, what about 150 millimeters? And, you know, so in other words, I would say, you know, 
go a bit further than the kind of the, the, the sort of the, the the masses, if you will, because mm -hmm. that's when you know you're striking a good, a good balance. The one thing I would say, actually, at the eaves of the house, Denise. So you've got your wall here, and you've got the overhang of the roof here. This yes. thickness here um, can have a big determination on how much insulation you put on your house, because obviously mm -hmm. you don't want to go out past the the the, the eaves. And because yes. then you're into a whole other yeah. ball game. But mm -hmm. um, what I, so that's what I would say, it, it, like for, just to give you an example, when we built this house here, we put 300 millimeters of insulation. Now, I remember at the time phoning yeah. up the manufacturer and saying, I need 300 millimeters of insulation. And they were saying, um, are you crazy? You know, what mm -hmm. kind of nutbag are you? And <laughs> probably 300 millimeters was too much. Um, mm -hmm. But what I would say is also one more point, I suppose, in answering your question, Denise, um, uh, before you do any major works on your house, get a BER done, a building energy yes. rating done, because sure. that is the benchmark where you are. Now. And your BER assessor would be able to say to you, say to your BER assessor, look, I was listening to this headbanger, Tomas O'Leary, and he was talking about 150 millimeters. You know, what would 150 millimeters get me? And he might go, you know, he'd go on his computer and he'd say, or that to get you to a B3. And you might say, well, I'd like to go a bit further now. What about, you know, could I, could I put 200 millimeters? And, you know, so mm. in other words, have a bit, get a good BER assessor, find out, you know, where your house is on that fridge scale, you know, of F, yes. uh, you know, between A and F. Mm -hmm. And as I say, just remember our little motto, whatever you do, do it right. And mm -hmm. even if it means that you're going to sort of not do the insulation until next year because you're going to you know blow your budget on the wall insulation at least you know you've done that right it's highly optimized you'd be super snug and comfortable mm -hmm. no it's great and and just uh when people are looking for ber assessors is there somewhere they can go to find somebody who's good or what you recommend for that yeah so go to the seai website sustainable yes. energy authority of ireland Mm -hmm. Go to the SEA web website. They actually have BER assessors for right around the country. Great. And um, so if you type in county, they'll pop up. And what I would say is um, um, with BER assessors, this is a bit of a fine point, but I, I'd like to make it. Don't skimp on, don't go looking for the cheapest BER assessor in your neighborhood. Because mm -hmm. if somebody is doing, if somebody's giving you a big, a good deal, remember they have to get into their car, drive to your house, survey your house, go back to their office, model everything in, in the software, pr produce a report, send it to you. Like there's quite a lot involved. And if you're going to do a major retrofit on your house, the last thing, I mean, for example, if you had a heart problem or if you had some sort of medical problem, you wouldn't go to someone, you wouldn't go to a non-qualified, you know, doctor, you'd go to somebody who's kind of good at what they do. So don't don't choose a BER assessor based on price. Phone a few of them and say, look, I'm doing a deep retrofit. Have you done deep retrofits? And what have you found? You know, tease them out and see if they've sort of done this kind of work before. Mm. And, um, you know, in other words, drill down a little bit. Do a sort of a semi-interview um, and, and say to them, you know, have you, like, my house is not great. I want to get to an A rating. Or, you know, just kind of suss them out on the phone. But anyway, mm -hmm. if you look up the SEAI website, you'll yeah. find a BER assessor and don't, don't select one based on price. Sure. Okay, now that's terrific advice. Great. And just you, you mentioned the SEAI website as well. All the information on grants for all of these things are there too. So it's a great uh, resource, yeah. actually, if anybody's interested in, in checking that out. Um, everything you need to know is, is there. So that's great. Uh, Tomas, just somebody asking about the thickness for the internal insulation, um, because that's considerably less now than the... Yes, it is. Now, here's the thing. I, I want to do a little bit of building physics, if I, if I can. Excellent. Uh, by oh, phone. fantastic. We didn't rehearse this, right? No. Okay. But let's say I'm in my daughter's uh, study room here, so I'm kind of looking around for materials. So let's say this is your external wall, right? Mm -hmm. And um, this is outside this is inside. So let's say on a very cold night, it's sort of zero degrees outside. Well, yeah. your wall, depending on the wall construction, this wall, this, the interior surface temperature of this wall is also going to be very low if there's no insulation in that wall, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you come along then, put some internal insulation on that wall, mm. uh, it makes sense, Denise, I think, 
think that the surface temperature here is still very low. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes. Like yeah. The interior temperature of your, of your room is nice and warm, but this mm -hmm. temperature back here is still cold. And if you put too much insulation there, this surface here could actually be below what we call uh, the, the critical temperature for mold. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, when you're insulating internally, you shouldn't actually use too much insulation, which sounds a bit weird. But if you, much, if you use too much insulation here, now there's no heat escaping through your house. And the surface temperature on the existing wall could be below 13 degrees. And if it's below 13 degrees, you'll have mold. It's just like gravity. You know, if I drop okay. this, it'll, it'll go. Yeah. And you, so th that's another reason not to do internal insulation. And, you know, in Ireland, we've been fascinated with dry lining forever. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the Germans and the Austrians and people who've been doing high-performance retrofits for decades, they just find it kind of a bit funny. And they don't understand why we do internal insulation. Obviously, if you're in a brick building, if you don't want to change bad, you know, then you won't have any choice. Yeah. So I realize I'm not giving you a straight answer, but the, no, the, the reason for that, Denise, is um, it, it, it's, uh, I don't want to use the word risk because that's a very emotive term. But mm -hmm. if you're doing internal insulation, you do need to be very careful. And I would even, if you contact the major producers, for example, Kingspan or, or um, oh God, uh, Oh God, extra term. Mm -hmm. If you contact some of the better, in, the bigger insulation companies, they'll actually do a condensation risk analysis for you. In other words, if you tell them the build up of your wall and tell them what you're proposing to do, they'll mm -hmm. actually tell you what the optimum thickness of insulation for that assembly is. Now mm -hmm. that might sound like a big ordeal, but trust me, it isn't. And um, they're looking to sell you product, but they won't sell you too much so that you'll end up in trouble. Okay. Um, so if, if, if you've got mold already on the inside of your building, dry lining is not going to help that because the surface is still cold. Yes. Okay. If you've got mold in your house, Denise, the very best way to get rid of that is externally insulate. Because in so doing, we've got our wall here now. Now we mm -hmm. put the insulation on the outside and then provide here a little bit. But now mm -hmm. the surface temperature of your wall is lovely and warm because it's actually inside in the house and it's sure. insulated from the exterior. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So the reason yes. you've got yeah. mold there now, mm -hmm. the reason you've got mold there now is because the, the because the temperature is low on a cold mm -hmm. uh, in cold weather. But if you externally insulate, you brought up that temperature. Okay, that's fantastic. I never did that before live. No, it worked but, very um, well. I, yeah, I the illustration better good. props, but. I <laughs> Works perfectly. I think it's great. And I just see it here, Tomas. So just somebody who is looking at retrofitting a small bungalow, and they're asking, is it okay to plant the water tank for the heat pump in the attic to save space? Um, the water tank for a heat pump. Um, I suppose you're talking about the general domestic uh, hot water tank. Is um, I'm not entirely sure what, what meant by that but basically to put a if you put the, or is it um, the, the cylinder water, perhaps if you put a, any, well it wouldn't be a cylinder obviously if you mm. i mean you would never put any container for warm water in the attic that would just be just crazy i mean you wouldn't ask your kids to sleep outside on a cold night so you you wouldn't mm. put your cold water tank in the attic but if it's just, a, sorry, a warm water tank, sorry, domestic hot water. If it's just a container for water, uh, you know, as a pressurized system, yeah, that's okay. Um, and, but um, if, if, the, if the, you, there are certain guidelines, whether you should insulate around that um, cold water tank or not, it makes sense to insulate it. So if you can imagine if this is your attic and this is your, your sort of cold water tank in the attic, you should bring insulation up and over and down the far side. In other words, kind of wrap a, a warm woolly blanket around it mm -hmm. so that it's sort of protected from the frost, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now that's great. And then just another one here, Tomas, on uh, insulation. Somebody who had their cavity wall pumped with bead 10 years ago, but now they're doing yeah. a major renovation yeah, and they're just wondering, should they externally insulate now? Always, yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, again, 
you'll say floor area, you won't have disruption inside, you don't have wet trades inside, um, you know, plastering, buckets of skim, all of that kind of thing. Mm. And, and you're saving floor area. Is, again, depending on where you, where you are, you know, that floor area could be quite valuable. If you're out in the countryside, sure. of course, on a half an acre site, you're not too worried about that. But mm. in terms of building physics, um, we always say you wear a jumper, you don't eat a jumper. So it's always better um, to have the insulation externally. Okay, that's fantastic. Brilliant. And then just to touch on heating systems to most, what, what is your recommendation there? Because I know this is a big issue as well for people trying to decide what's best. So what do you recommend generally? Well, again, if we think about, I mean, if, we, if, if you pull out a little bit and you think, you, you, you think about the big picture here, Denise, mm. if you were to arrive from, let's say, planet Mars and the Martian was saying to you, oh, how do you heat your house in Ireland? Oh, what we do is we take oil out of the ground on the far side of the world in the Middle East, right? Now, there's very little oil left and it pollutes our planet, but we're not worried about that. So we take the oil out of the ground um, we we ship it over in the big boat uh, to Ireland. Now, the Martian is kind of looking at you at this stage saying, like, you know, are you for real? And then we burn that in, a, in, a, in an oil boiler and it releases all these toxic fumes into the atmosphere, which is frying our planet. Um, so, I mean, we like having the knowledge that we know now, it makes no sense to be burning oil um, or, or peat or wood for, for that matter. Um, mm -hmm. Now the energy, so we can't make oil and we can't make gas um, not very easily um, or coal, but what we can make is electricity, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about the beauty of that, imagine if your heating system was based on electricity and you had a, an, your own electricity generation plant, uh, in other words, a solar system, um, mm -hmm. Now, so I suppose it's a very long-winded way of answering your question, Denise, but we need to move away from, from using oil. And um, if I'm honest, I'm not really a fan of using gas either, but that's maybe, you know, a lot of people have gas and that's fine, I suppose. Um, a gas or an oil boiler is about maybe 95% efficient, mm -hmm. whereas a heat pump is 100% efficient. Imagine that. So for every one unit of electricity you put into your heat pump, you get about three or four units of heat out. Yeah. And so it's really quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And um, now a heat pump will only work if your building is very efficient. If you live okay. in an F or a G or, you know, a G rated house. So it's a bit like if you have a big old heavy car, uh, there's no point in putting an electric engine into it because you run out of power and, you know, you won't get very far. So. Sure. I think we need to go electric. We need to go heat pumps. Mm -hmm. um, the climate in Ireland is so mild. Like we do a lot of work in the US, in Canada, in very extreme climates, and they use heat pumps there. So they're actually extracting heat from the air, even if it's kind of minus 20 degrees Celsius. So um, I would say, and the other thing about that, Denise, is if you're using heat pump, you have no oil tank, you have no gas connection, you have no green cows, I call it, in your back garden full of petroleum. And mm -hmm. um, you have no deliveries anymore. You have one utility bill. There's no smell. Uh, it's super mm -hmm. safe. Um, you know, there's a ton of reasons um, why we should go uh, electric. And um, so, as you can see, I'm a very big fan of that. One last thing on that, Denise. The cynics would say, well, you know, if you're using a heat pump, well, you're using electricity, and electricity comes from coal and gas. That's mm -hmm. true. But our electricity grid is getting cleaner and cleaner. So what I mean by that is there's more and more wind energy going into our grid every year. Yeah. And Ireland now is probably one of the cleanest electricity grids, uh, I would say possibly in the world. So the electricity, at least, the, you know, the electrons that are coming into your house, at least are pretty clean. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, look, heat pump all the way. Okay, that's fantastic. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and then the other big question that we're getting a lot and a lot of people over this time now um, just saying that they're going to replace their windows and windows is another fantastic way, obviously, of uh, completely uh, saving energy in your home. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, when it comes to windows, yes. this is the biggest question we get is about triple glazing. And do you have to go for triple glazing everywhere? 
So you don't have to go for triple glazing, um, but I would re recommend it. I mean, um, you know, if somebody came to your house now trying to sell you single glazing, you'd sort of look at them and say, sorry, what? Nobody's using single glazing anymore. And it'll be the same mm -hmm. for triple glazing I, I, within the next decade. So if I was doing a major renovation on my house, I would definitely go triple glazing, no question about it. Now, again, people are going okay. to be sitting there thinking, well, it's more expensive. Well, of course it's more expensive. But it's actually, if you mm -hmm. think about the life cycle of your house, excuse me, and the life cycle of the window, uh, yeah. it's, it's actually cheaper, Denise, over the life cycle of that window to, to put in a, a high performance triple glaze window than, than a double glaze window. I, I mean, that's just irrefutable. Again, that's just physics. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you might be saving short term right but on the long term um you'll pay for it if you put in uh, uh, uh now there are very 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 good double glaze windows so if you want to, if you don't want to go triple you know buy the best uh, double glaze window that money can buy but when you get into that mm -hmm. level of specification on a double glaze window you'll find actually that triple is not that much more expensive That's and i'll right. say one yeah. more well, thing i mean the, I the costs have um, yeah sure sure yeah sorry um if, if you look around your house, most people look around their house this morning, they'll see something underneath all their windows and that'll be a radiator. And the reason we have mm -hmm. radiators across the world underneath our windows is because the window is such a poor performing element of the house that um, you get a downdraft in front of the window uh, when the weather is cold because cold air is heavier. And so you get, to, you get this cold air descending in front of the window. And when I was growing mm -hmm. up in my home place, I never like, really appreciated it but when my daughter went to college this year I was helping her move into her dormitory and she was unpacking and I was there on my phone checking emails and she was had stuff on the bed and it was this huge big radiator underneath the window and she was talking to herself you know and she was saying oh what's that thing what is this? Oh, what's that for and and because she doesn't have a radiator in a bedroom and it was just it was hilarious for me to watch her <laughs> um, so we don't have radiators underneath our windows because so it, it actually frees up a bit of space you have less clutter in your house um, so I would say again Denise like what I was saying on installation thickness um, mm -hmm. take your time look at the book look at the book shop around this is a very big decision don't just go with the default like everybody else is doing it like yeah, the reason yeah. our planet is going down the toilet is because people aren't actually investing enough research and effort into this, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, one Absolutely, last thing, getting yeah. back to the BER assessor. If you ring up your BER assessor and he says, and, and you say to him, you know, what about triple glazing? If they sort of dismiss that out of hand, if they say, ah, waste of money, wouldn't bother, then you should start to mm -hmm. think, right, is this BER assessor somebody who's going to be, you know, thinking critically on my part, or are they just going with the sort of, the sort of tweedledee tweedledum that everybody is doing you know um, mm -hmm. so I suppose to come full circle on that Denise if you're going to change out your windows don't put in outdated technology at least put in a very high performance double glaze window but honestly triple glazing is going to be the norm when I, I don't want to say it's, it's going to be the standard because that would be unfair but you know mm -hmm. double glazing is going to phase out in Ireland in the next short while in my opinion and um, so don't sort of, you know, put in a future proof your windows, put in the best and you'll enjoy that. OK, now that, that's very sound advice. Fantastic. And is it the same on a southerly aspect uh, for triple gazing? Because often, you know, you'll hear that, well, definitely on a north or easterly facade, triple gazing is, is by far the best choice, but not necessarily the case on a southerly aspect. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for the amount you're going to change, for the amount you're going to save, you know, mixing double and triple, it really is not worth it. And that's okay. a bit of an old wives' tale, Denise, and I we hear that a lot as well. <laughs> you need to think yeah. about you need to, you need to think about window not during the daytime but during the nighttime, right? So okay. imagine now we're yeah. in November. It's half past six in the evening. It's minus five degrees outside, or it's zero degrees outside. You know, there's mm -hmm. no solar gains. There's no sun hitting the building. It's dark, it's cold, it's winter. And um, mm -hmm. think about that. I mean, it makes no sense now to have double on one side of the house and triple on the other side. You're going to have literally, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have an extraordinary amount of heat losses on the double 
side, the double glazing side as compared to the triple glazing. So forget about this double yeah. on the front, uh, you know, double on the side, and triple on the north. And if you think about the logic of sort of, you know, six o'clock in the night in November or December or midnight or four o'clock in the morning, that's when you're going to be sitting mm -hmm. there in bed thinking like, what the hell did I do with double glazing on one side and triple on the other? Yeah. Okay. No, that's terrific. And you're right. Like, I mean, I, you know, we've seen in, in recent years, certainly the costs are coming down for triple glazing, you know, so they're, they're not, in, depending on what frame you go with, there's not actually that much difference, um, you know, in some cases. So the, definitely worth yeah, doing research. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Well, Tomas, thank you so much. I mean, we could go on and on and on, but I'm just so conscious of your time this morning. Um, you've been fascinating. And I, I hope, um, you. you know, <laughs> uh, you've answered everybody's questions, which is terrific. And by all means, um, everybody should check out uh, your website and you have so much information. Um, mm -hmm. Honestly, we, we should do another one sometime soon. But thank you so much uh, for your time Please. this morning. Uh Lovely. And I just leave you with, with just one parting idea, Denise, again, just to repeat, I would say, guys, if you're going to do a major renovation on your home or you're building a new home, don't cut corners on energy efficiency. You've got one opportunity to do it right and um, push it to the maximum and you'll reap the benefits in terms of energy and comfort and well-being. So, Denise, thank you so much for having me here this morning and uh, everybody stay safe, stay healthy and we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Tomorrow, thank you so much. Bye bye. Now. Thanks, everybody. Take care now. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.